welcome to Hard Talk India. My guest today is considered one of the champions of Indian democracy. From starters orders when the elections are called right up to the moment when the winner breasts the tape, he ensures that all the players abide by the rules. He has a reputation for being tough but also fair, which of course is why he won the coveted Max AC award, but this is also why many people are critical of him and some even consider him controversial. Here today to talk about his views and his actions is the Chief Election Commissioner of India, James Lingdo. Mr. Lingdo, earlier this month in a lecture in Delhi, you said that in India the real challenge wasn't simply holding elections, but free and fair elections. Who or what is the real problem? Oh, it's, it's really the, the politicians. And uh, actually, we've, we, we as an institution have always had to have a, a power struggle with the political executive to be able to carry out uh, proper elections. Now, you also said that whilst holding elections in Jammu and Kashmir was risky, it was actually easier than Bihar and Chhattisgarh. Was it the quality of politicians that made the difference? No, in fact, the, the entire state of Jammu and Kashmir, I mean, every inch of it is, is uh, saturated with, with the sovereignty of the state. Whereas in, in those places, more than half the state is, uh, it belongs to somebody else. It's not the state at all. In other words, the sovereignty of the state acts as a filter in Jammu and Kashmir in restraining the influence of politicians, and that filter isn't present in Chhattisgarh and Bihar. In Chhattisgarh and Bihar, politicians have their way. No, they don't have their way. In fact, uh, they, their writ runs in, uh, in a small part of the territory. The rest belongs to somebody else, whoever it is, whether it's underground or PWG, whoever. In fact, this is something you remarked on. You said that half of Bihar, Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh and even some parts of Andhra Pradesh were completely outside the state system. Is that what you meant? Yes, absolutely. You mean someone other than the state rules there? Yes. Indian politicians have no say in what No, happens. no, absolutely not. They dare not go there. On the flip side, you said that in Gujarat, once the riots were over and once the model code of conduct was in place, the civil service actually became professional yeah. and an effective election was possible. Yeah. What made the difference? What was the cause of the change? The civil servants normally work quite cohesively, quite effectively when, when elections are around because they basically are under the election commission. And in normal times, of course, they are under the politicians and the political executive. And they, they do whatever they want and, and, and at that time, I suppose, they... they is subject to their political masters in, in, in inverted commas, whatever that means. So once the influence of their political masters was removed, after the code of conduct came into place, civil servants became professional. Yes. You are suggesting that in fact the determining influence in all the examples we've just talked about is what people call the pernicious influence of politicians. Yes. From your vantage point, as Chief Election Commissioner, how bad is this influence? Oh, it's, uh, I suppose in, in present terms it means, you know, it's, it's just finding the till as, as quickly as possible. It's uh, an election, if you look at it from a, from a, a not so nice point of view, is like, uh, it's like, it's like the time when Zamindaris used to be auctioned in the old days, and uh, a five-year term by, by many, many governments of the day is looked upon as, as a five-year lease of the Zamindari, and therefore they can do whatever they want in those five years. So you're saying that politicians are exploiters? Basically, it's, it's exploiting the potential, the resources of a, of a particular state. I mean, that's, that's how many of them look upon it. You're also suggesting that they run the state and they occupy their offices with their own personal interest, not that of the people or the country in yes, mind. Yes. You're serious about that? Yes, I'm absolutely serious. In there, are, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are there are exceptions, but by and large this is so in the present circumstances. In a recent interview to Rediff.com, you said, if you are exposed too much to politicians, you are bound to be corrupt. If you get exposed to them for too long, you will get cancer. <laughs> that's, a, 
Yes, it's a it humorous is. expression, but did you mean to put it so colorfully and vehemently? Yes, I mean, it, it, uh, it explains itself very nicely. I mean, I don't have to say any more. But you are saying that politicians are a cancer? Yeah, they are. They are, in fact. A virulent cancer that kills? Yes. A disease that is afflicting the body politic of India? Yes. And we, we haven't been able to find any, any cure for cancer yet. So, uh, in due course, if cancer is cured, then we'll have to find some other expression. But in due course, when cancer isn't cured, and up to now there is no cure for cancer, it yes. kills. It does, yes. So the body politic is under threat of death. Yes. And there is no <coughs> cure. There isn't at the moment. In the same Rediff interview, you were asked if you could think of a single politician who was committed to democracy and who had the welfare of the people. And your reply was, I really cannot think of anyone. Did you mean that? Yes, I mean, I, I do mean it, yes. There is not a <coughs> single living politician in India today that you think is committed to democracy? Yes. That's a stinging indictment of Indian democracy. Because democracy means a whole lot of other things. I mean, it's not, not merely going through the, the motions of, a, of, a, of an election. Democracy means, you know, basically individual freedom. And that you respect individual freedom to the, to the uttermost extent. Now, I can't think of anybody who's, who's that involved in individual freedom. You can't think of a single politician who respects individual freedom and cares about the welfare of the people? Yeah, I mean, to, to the uttermost extent. I mean, I, I don't think there's anybody around now. Which means that today <coughs> in India, the country is ruled by people who really aren't fit to rule. Well, I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, going, that's going pretty far, but then, you know... Uh, but that follows from what you're saying? Yeah, you... well, I mean... Yeah. <laughs> you can... You clearly don't like politicians. Why? Is it their character? Is it the profession? Or is it your experience of them? Well, I mean, uh, experience is very, very important. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I think in, in, in today's circumstances. There are very few of them who, who even know how to talk politely. Um, there are very few who, who understand the basic courtesies. There are very few who, um, who talk to you on equal terms as a human being. Either they, they have their noses stuck in the air and, or they prostrate at somebody's feet. And there, there's nothing in between. And there's very little, very few politicians who can, who are in between and, and, and speak to you at the same level, I mean, as, as just good human beings. The only thing you haven't talked about is their education. Do you think Indian politicians, by and large, are well educated? No, I mean, not, not the present lot, certainly not. Not the present lot? No. That applies across the board? No, no, of course not. I mean, there, there are exceptions. There's some of them who would, who would who are too well educated, but uh, by and large, no. You spent 20 years of your career when you first began as a civil servant in Bihar. How much of your views of politicians and how many experiences that have turned you against them happened during that period? A lot of it. <clears throat> a lot of it. And uh, even in the old days, uh, there were, well, I mean, there, there, there were not too many of them who who knew how to talk properly. It uh, used to be considered once upon a time India's best administered state. Today Bihar is perhaps a synonym for the complete absence of administration. Are politicians responsible? Absolutely, 100%. Because that, that state could be recovered in no time at all. And yet people turn around and say that Lalu Yadav and his success in Bihar is a symbol of how Indian democracy has actually reached down to the grassroots and today the electors are choosing people in a reflection of themselves. You question that. Yeah. I mean, that, that state could be turned around in six months and with, with, proper, uh, with proper gardening, proper cultivation. Uh, six, six months is, uh, is more than enough. Why isn't it being turned around? Just because of Lalu Yadav? It's... Yeah, I mean, I mean he's, he has to take the blame for, ultimately, for what has happened. 
Mr. Lingo, you made it clear that you don't think very highly of politicians. Let me flip the conversation and say, as Chief Election Commissioner, do you think it's fitting that you should be publicly so cynical of them, if not dismissive and even contemptuous? It's my duty to, to do that because nobody else is going to do it. That's a strange interpretation of the duty of the Chief Election Commissioner, to be yeah, contemptuous it, and dismissive. It might, it might be strange, but then somebody has to do that. <clears throat> and I think, I think everybody's uh, flattering, flattering them all the time, and, and uh, they they only get worse that way. I mean, somebody has to has to tell them they're not they're not as lovely as, as they think they are. So you see the duty of the <coughs> chief election commissioner to reveal and expose and show up politicians for what they are. I don't want to expose anybody, but then if somebody asks me the question, I have to tell them the truth. Your critics say that look at the things he keeps saying. Politicians have become worse and worse. They are tricky people who keep on cheating. They say he's deliberately encouraging people to adopt his views. Actually, I didn't use the word uh, tricky. I mean, that was, the, that was in the question. I did use the word cheating. And I, and I like to use the word cheating because that, that explains things very well. Do you see them as common cheats? Yes, it's cheating all the time. I mean, but don't you, you think that by speaking like this in public, you're encouraging people to develop the same cynicism and share the same contempt that you have of politicians? No, you see, the, the point is very simple. Uh, the, the only thing which was talked about all these years was that uh, India was a marvelous democracy, the biggest democracy in the world, and so on and so forth. All self-flattery, self-blandishment, and so on. And we all sort of uh, gloating, gloating over this when, when we oughtn't to. I mean, uh, it, it's about time, it was about time that somebody spoke the truth. In other words, you were correcting a form of delusion that India had been indulging in for decades. Yes. Your views are not just the truth, they're a necessary correction yes. to the false impression that Indian yes. democracy yes. is working. I would love, I'd love to make a, a correction sometime in the future. I mean, after after seeing things improving. I'd love to do that, and I, 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 I don't want to be, to, be, to be a prophet of doom or something like that. That's not my intention. That, of course, is for the future. At the <coughs> moment, for many people, you are a prophet of doom. In fact, what your critics say is that he's deliberately playing to the press gallery. He's seeking popularity. He's attracting attention for himself at the cost of the legislature and the executive. No, it's not like that at all. I mean, I, I, I'm not looking for for any crumbs or anything from anybody. And, and I never, I've, never, I've never asked for anything f from anybody throughout my, my career. So I'm, I'm very clear about this. Since um, you're talking about crumbs and not ever asking for anything, if you were to be offered a post-election job and you retire in the first week of February, would you refuse it on principle? Yes, absolutely. In other words, James Lingdo will have nothing to do with any job offered by the government once he retires as Chief Election Commissioner. Yes. It's not just your views on politicians which are extremely outspoken, for which you are well known. You're also well known for the language you use. People say you're a blunt and outspoken man. Do you accept that characterization? Yeah, I mean, when, why not? I, mean, <laughs> I don't believe in, in, uh, in using a dozen words if two will suffice. But do you think sometimes you use words that are needlessly harsh? Maybe. Could you know, be. Could be? Yes. Do you think at times you need to develop the art of discretion rather than outspokenness? No, I mean, it's rather late in the day. I mean, I, if I had done that, I would, I would have done it as a civil servant all these years. And, and if you couldn't develop, in this, develop the whole thing in the civil service, I mean, obviously, you couldn't do it outside it. In other words, by definition <coughs> by character you are blunt and outspoken and that's the way you're going to remain yes do you think on reflection you were right to call the district collector of Baroda a joker to have publicly asked him are you ashamed of yourself or would you accept looking back that perhaps that was a slip of the tongue that you today no it pregnant? wasn't a slip of the tongue at all in fact uh, it wasn't meant for the for the media or indeed for the mic or whatever I mean I, I was just uh, I was scolding him as a senior, and uh, I completely forgot that there was a mic there I mean, to catch every, every little word that I spoke. 
Do you think you should have been aware of the presence of the mic? Because they were perfectly visible. There were lots of journalists, not just one or two. I know. Well, then you, you, you do get, uh, when you, you get irritated, uh, you, you're, not, uh, you're not always that careful. Would you concede that you got carried away in your anger? No. The anger was perfectly justified. But uh, maybe I should have been more, more aware of the mics and, and, and <laughs> the media around me. Is that a small little lapse that I see as a concession? You should have been more aware of the media. And it's the a very small lapse, yes. I, I'm not regretting the main thing. I'm only regretting the, the fact that it got around when it, it should have been confined to smaller quarters. Let me quote to you what one of the papers said of your language at that time. They said he's guilty of intemperance and seemingly arrogant disregard for the dignity of others. Oh, they, people are, are free to, their own, uh, to have their own opinion. And, and, and I, I won't question that because it's, it's all part of democracy anyways. Tian Session, your illustrious predecessor, said this language is not consistent with the dignity of the commission. Well, I mean, he's... I mean, with the kind of language which he used in the past, I mean, he ought to know better. I mean, it's a case of the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> You'll have to find something, uh, something more colorful than the pot. <laughs> Connected with what people call your blunt language is what's come to be called your confrontational style. They say he shoots from the lip, he rushes to judgment, whereas in fact he should pause to consult and consider before he comments. There are things where you need to pause and consider, and I, I take my own time about those things. There are certain things where you don't need to pause and consider, and you can, you can speak your, your mind immediately. And I, I think there's no point in, in wasting time over things that, that can be done quickly. So whenever you've spoken your mind immediately, you've always been right to do so. You've never regretted it? No, of course not. What about the instance when you shot down the Deputy Prime Minister's suggestion that in fact parliamentary and state assembly elections should be held simultaneously. You said that this was undemocratic. You said it was going to create an opportunity for greater cheating. Was that necessary? Well, I don't know about the, well, the cheating, yes, but in the, in the sense that, uh, uh, you see, there, there's a context there. I mean, the, the cheating because you need about 400 companies in, in a state like Bihar to conduct elections in, in Bihar. If you, if, you, if, you need, if you only have parliamentary elections throughout the country, then, then you don't need forces of this kind. But if you, if you have assembly elections and parliamentary elections at the same time throughout the country, then for a state like Bihar, you need 400 companies, at least. And you'll need at least another 400 companies in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, you'll need somewhere like 400 companies in UP. Where are you going to find all these bosses? Except for the fact that... And, the and hold on, let me finish. So when you, when you say simultaneous, it should mean uh, at least, you know, finishing the whole thing in one or two days. Since the forces are not there, simultaneous would in fact mean staggering the, 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 the election for about a month. And if you do that, then I don't call that simultaneous, you see. So you've got to understand all this. Except for the fact that the Deputy Prime Minister was simply raising a subject for public discussion. He wasn't making a formal proposal. You shot it down so swiftly. I shot it down because somebody asked me the question. I mean, I, 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 please, <laughs> you have to remember, I, I don't go to the media at all. It's, it's when somebody, somebody asks me a question, then I have to answer. What about another <coughs> example? When Chandra Babu Naidu, the Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh, dissolved the assembly <coughs> and called for an early election, within minutes, literally within minutes, you said, an early election wouldn't be possible. Well, there were some, some media people outside my office, and the moment I was going for lunch, I mean, they, they caught hold of me and they asked me the question. And, and obviously, I, I, I just couldn't... Um, Mr. Lingdo, the media will always be outside your office. In a yeah, sense, so they're I attracted by the fact that you speak so boldly and bluntly. Should you not have been more restrained? I... I find it difficult to, to um, you know, well, I mean, I can't, I can't tell them an untruth, and I can't mislead them. What about refusing to and answer the question? It's, well, it's difficult to evade. It's, 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 something, it's something so juicy. I mean, you know, you... you uh, You're tempted to speak, even when you shouldn't? You, you can't. 
you can't have a, 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 an election immediately. I mean, they, you, you, have, you have to prepare for an election. But look at the tone and tenor of your comment on that occasion. Many people said it sounded needlessly combative. They said it sounded confrontational. You said the election commission takes its own time and holds elections whenever it is ready. That's true. Except that it sounded so dismissive of the chief minister and his request. No, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a friendly advice. I mean, that's all. Not couched yeah. in a friendly way. Maybe not, but then... Uh, you I, can see that. I also, I also told them that I wouldn't be conducting those elections. So obviously it has to be taken as, as friendly advice, nothing more than that. The impression has <coughs> been gained during the last three years that under James Lingdo, much has happened earlier under TN Session, the Election Commission seems to operate in confrontation with the government rather than in coordination with governments. No, you don't. Uh, you, you can't coordinate with the government. I mean, much in the same way as the Supreme Court would never think of coordinating with the government, nor with the High Court. We function independently as much as they do. And uh, when you conduct free and fair elections, the confrontation comes in. It's all in the free and fair part of it. In other words, confrontation and competitiveness is inherent in the nature and independence of the Election Commission. Yeah, in, in, and in free and fair elections. It's, it's, it's absolutely inevitable. You can't get away from it. It used to be said in the 60s, 70s, and perhaps right through the 80s, that the election commission of the time had become a sort of handmaiden to governments that existed in those decades. Today, people say, in contrast, the pendulum has swung perhaps too far the other way. The election commission behaves as if it's competition to governments. No, there's no competition. In fact, we, we, like, uh, we like gadflies. We... We bounce over the water, and the water being the elections. And the elections are so, um, they, 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 pass, they pass before you realize that, that they've come. And we, we touch the body politic in that fashion. I mean, it's it just, it just a, it just a mo moment, and, and, and it's all gone. And, and we, we are not concerned with the day-to-day -day functioning of the government. Let me remind you of what K. M. Munshi, one of the founding fathers of the Indian Constitution, said in the Constituent Assembly in 1949, when in fact the articles dealing with the Election Commission were being discussed. He said, there will be a great political danger if the Election Commission becomes a political power in the country. In a sense, your critics say that danger is being realized today. No, you, you, you're quoting Munshi, you should have quoted the other people in the Constituent Assembly who were mortally scared of of the political executive swallowing the, the election commission hook, line and sinker. You're saying the danger, in other words, is yes, the other way. Yes, and in fact, they, they, they were, they were so, so concerned about keeping the two apart that they said free and fair elections should be a fundamental right for every Indian citizen. And they were seriously thinking of incorporating free and fair elections as a fundamental right in the, in the chapter on fundamental rights in the Constitution. Would you rather that was today incorporated? Is that your recommendation? Is that your advice oh, that, to the Indian that, people? That would have been lovely. So your parting message, six weeks before you hand down office, is incorporate free and fair elections as a fundamental right in the Indian constitution. Absolutely. But do you think the politicians of today are going to listen to you and do it? Well, they, can, they, they don't listen to me. I mean, they listen to, to their predecessors who... who um, but they didn't listen to their predecessors. Well, 55 years have passed nearly. They haven't, but then it, it's about time that they reflected. But today what you're doing is you're sending a message above the heads of political parties and politicians to the people of India to say, generate pressure for free and fair elections to be incorporated as a fundamental right. Yeah. And if they turn around and say to you, why is it so important, what would you say? I'd make them uh, go through the proceedings of the of the, those deliberations in the Constituent Assembly. They are very, very uh, valid for today and people should read them. So you're also saying that in contrast to the bit of K.M. Munshi I quoted, it is important for the Election Commission to be a power. And if that power has certain political overtones, yeah. so be it. But it's important, it should be independent, assertive, strong and stand up. See, I, I, I have to make it very clear. We do not figure in the separation of powers in, any, in, in, the, in, 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 in the Indian democracy. Um, separation of powers, but, but there's also the other aspect, which is uh, each of these powers sort of 
being a check on the other. Now, we have to check the, 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 the political executive just before the elections and during the elections. We have to check them without being one of these three uh, organs of, this, of, of the state. In other words, you have to be a fourth power in your own right. We have to be a fourth power for only for that, for that period, for that brief period. James Lindor, a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you. Thank you very much.